right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Chloe. I am a policy analyst here at USCRI, and we're so excited to have all of you on for our second quarterly policy briefing. We've got a lot of fun stuff in store for you today, so I'll jump right in. Um, as you probably know, if you're in the DC area or even somewhere in Texas, we have a lot of crazy weather going on. So if anything, for whatever reason, uh, goes, goes wrong, goes blank, um, please look at the Eventbrite updates uh, for more information. Hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties, but I did want to plug that. Um, so to introduce myself, like I said, I'm Chloe. I'm one of three policy analysts here at USCRI. Um, our policy and advocacy group here is fairly new. Um, my main focus is uh, on refugee issues, mainly international. Uh, I also work on unaccompanied refugee minors, um, climate related uh, refugee events, as well as um, some other related issues. My main geographic focus is Sub-Saharan Africa. We have two other policy analysts as well who are wonderful. Um, if you're not familiar with USCRI, we are the US Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. We have been around for over a hundred years. Um, we're one of nine resettlement organizations that have been resettling refugees in the US since the 1970s. We also work on a lot of other issues such as unaccompanied minors coming over the border, uh, trafficking survivors and domestic and foreign immigration policy. So we do a, a little bit of everything. Um, as you all know, today's briefing will be talking about the situations of migrants, uh, mainly forced migrants in Sudan and South Sudan, including obviously we would be remiss to uh, forget uh, the crisis that's coming over from Ethiopia as well. So we'll be talking about uh, refugee and IDP flows um, in the region. We have three wonderful speakers with us today. But before I introduce our first speaker, if you all have any questions that you uh, want to ask the speakers, please put them in the chat box. The chat box will be privately monitored so um, we can ask those questions at the end. Uh, so with that, I wanna kick it off and introduce our first speaker, Annette Sheckler. Annette is the Director of Communications at USCRI, um, but she has a wealth of knowledge about Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. She's been studying and writing about the Horn for over 25 years. She has worked across sectors in international development in the Horn. Uh, she also worked for the government of Ethiopia for seven years at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as the Office of the First Lady. Um, so Annette is gonna kick it off, give us some context for the current refugee crisis uh, from Ethiopia to Eastern Sudan. She's got some great slides prepared. So I will turn it over to her. Um, thank you, Chloe, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my job is to give some background and context um, about a word that the average person may just be reading about in passing uh, in the New York Times or the Washington Post. But for 7 million people in Ethiopia and for the tens of thousands of, of family members here in the US, this is a war that has huge consequences. And although the shorter term geopolitical consequences may not seem great uh, today, the longer term implications, not just for Ethiopia as a country, but for the entire region are quite immense and of concern to the United States government. I'd like to start off by, by just giving you four defining features of this war. The first, and, and, and let me say at the outset, not that any war is simple, but this war has a lot of moving parts and a lot of players. It, it's an unusual arrangement of combatants. The main feature is that the central government is fighting one of its regional states in collaboration with a foreign government and perhaps two foreign governments. So Ethiopia is at war with a region called Tigray in collaboration with the government to the north of Ethiopia, Eritrea, and perhaps the United Arab Emirates, um, it appears that they have been supplying drones um, through Eritrea. 
Um, secondly, within the state of Tigray, there are refugees from one of the combatant states. So there are Eritrean refugees inside Tigray who had fled Eritrea, who is now fighting Tigray. Are you with me so far? Um, thirdly, um, this war has accompanied by genocidal acts that are targeting the Tigrayan ethnic group, not just inside Tigray, um, indiscriminate bombing of civilians, uh, indiscriminate uh, killings, rape as a weapon of war, starvation as a weapon of war, and so on. But people outside the region, uh, if you are a Tigrayan living in the capital, for example, your bank account has been frozen, your business may have been taken away, you may have been evicted from your home, um, and you may not be able to leave the airport despite having a valid Ethiopian passport. And lastly, in 2021, this war is being live streamed on mobile phones. So when there's electricity in Tigray, um, if you look at social media, you can see uh, the war actually being fought on the streets in front of you. But first, let's begin with a map. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and I've put together just a few PowerPoint slides. Uh, hopefully that will be helpful to understanding again this, this very complex war with lots of moving parts and players. This is a map, as you can see, and here are the places to focus on. Um, first of all, uh, this area, can you see my mouse? Uh, this area here is, is Tigray. This is one of the nine uh, ethnic federal regions. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, inside uh, Ethiopia. To the north is Eritrea. Uh, south is the Amhara region. To the west is Sudan. And that's where the refugees are fleeing from um, Tigray. Um, I put together a little timeline and some of the major players. The major players here are the government of Ethiopia, the regional government of Tigray, the government of Eritrea, the regional state of Amhara militias, the United Arab Emirates, and of course, Sudan, which is where the refugees are going. But to start, Ethiopia is a, a country that has existed in one form or another for 3,000 years. In fact, they say they were Christians a thousand years before Christ was born. It's a very old state. But we have to go back to 1991, when a coalition of four fronts or groups overthrew a military Marxist regime. This is when the current problems began, although like any kind of conflict, you can go back centuries. We want to focus on 1998 to 2000. There was a war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And from, from 2000 to 2018, it was called uh, a state of no war, no peace. There was no military combat. There were skirmishes on the border. But at the same time, there was no peace agreement. And that's another long story. Um, from 2016 to 2018, there were, uh, that was a period of huge discontent. There was violence across Ethiopia. And the, the violence itself uh, chipped away at the foundation of the ruling coalition. So by 2018, you had a new prime minister elected and a new government. It was bloodless. It was done through the uh, uh, constitutional means. So that was a very positive thing that happened in Ethiopia. Because as you know, uh, peaceful transfer of power um, is a very difficult thing to achieve, certainly in Africa. And as we saw in January, even in the United States. 
Another key development was September 2020 when Tigray, just the region, held an election for its leadership. And the leadership that was elected was this TPLF. They are the regional government of Tigray. Now, they had been dominant in the four groups that had ruled Ethiopia for 27 years. There's a lot of uh, uh, hostility towards uh, the TPLF and unfortunately towards the people of Tigray who are only about 8% of the Ethiopian population. Now in November, 2020, uh, after this election, because Ethiopia did not hold its national elections because of the COVID pandemic. So Tigray considered the federal government illegitimate after October. And the federal government considered the Tigray government illegitimate because they had suspended the elections. So in November, um, it, again, it's a very interesting uh, arrangement. About 80% of the government's defense arms were located in Tigray. And the federal government had sent a plane with some generals into Tigray, the capital, and said, we want our weapons back. Tigray, which has been at odds with the federal government for the past two years, said, not in a million years. They kept the Antonov, sent the generals back, and then the war started. So this is sort of you know, a shorthand of how this terrible war began. Just a, a brief overview of the roots of the conflict. Ethiopia is a country with over 100 ethnic groups. And ethnicity has always been um, a problem in Ethiopia. Particularly, certain ethnic groups believed that they were dominated by certain other ethnic groups. And this domination has shifted. Um, the first uh, president, later prime minister of Ethiopia, Mela Zanawi, decided that rather than fighting uh, this problem of, of ethnicity, he would, the government would base the country's political system on something called ethnic federalism. This is a kind of uh, federal arrangement Nigeria has, India has, there are a number of countries where the local governments, the regional governments are based on the dominant ethnicity. So each ethnic regional state spoke their own language, their government uh, services were in their own language, education, and they were trying to build uh, a, a degree of autonomy in each of these states. But there was still this perception of dominance within the, the coalition for the TPLF. Um, at certain points in time, you know, democracy is a process. We've all seen what happened to our democracy recently. You know, it's not linear and it's quite messy. There was a failure of democratization within the central government and the EPRDF, and also one might argue within the opposition because after an election in 2005, um, despite winning about 35% of the seats, they refused to take their seats in the parliament. So you have the dominance again of a one party rule. Um, there is in Ethiopia a zero sum game political culture, meaning that compromise is a dirty word. So for most political groups in Ethiopia, it's an all or nothing equation. Obviously, uh, Ethiopia is in a bad neighborhood, Eritrea to the north, Somalia uh, to the west, east, and South Sudan. Um, Ethiopia was known as the anchor state in uh, US uh, foreign policy because it was in a bad neighborhood. Beginning in 2005, there was dis uh, decreasing political space. Uh, both by the EPRDF and then in 2018 with the new government, although promising reforms, we have seen the political state uh, uh, space actually narrow 
The two years of tension, there was a lot of violence across Ethiopia in the different regions. Um, there's a huge youth bulb in bulge in Ethiopia. You know, two thirds of the population are under, I think, 18. And uh, despite being the most uh, well-educated and the healthiest population in the history of Ethiopia, there were not enough jobs. So you have a lot of uh, unemployed youth, which is always uh, uh, not a healthy aspect for any kind of country. Um, two years of tension between the TPLF and the central government. And then in uh, 2016, 2018, excuse me, when uh, the new prime minister took power, he actually made peace with the North, with Isaiah Safwerki in Eritrea, and the border opened. And when the border opened between Ethiopia and Eritrea, lots of Eritreans uh, left Eritrea, and many of them fled because Eritrea is not a very easy place to live. It, 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 it's been called the North Korea of Africa. And then this, 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 this whole thing with the Northern Command happened with, um, uh, with uh, the military as a resource uh, in the region that the government was fighting with. So these are, these are again, it's a country with a 3,000 year old history. This is a shorthand for what led up to, to this war. Now, what's uh, unusual about this uh, war is that uh, 96,000 Eritreans were living in uh, Ethiopia, mainly in Tigray. Um, and they are um, compatriots with uh, one of the combatants. Just a brief shorthand, Eritrea and Ethiopia were together at some part of their history. But Eritreans fought for 30 years for independence. And in 1995, there was a referendum and they voted for independence. It was the unfortunate war in 1998 with Ethiopia, with that you know, period of no war, no peace. But again, when the border opened, a lot of Eritreans who had been fleeing uh, Eritrea, uh, mainly a lot of it had to do with youth, uh, feeling that there were no opportunities and a very strict conscription uh, uh, system that kept youth in the military. Uh, it could be decades before anyone got out. Um, so in the end, we had four, you can see four refugee camps of Eritreans living in Tigray. Although Ethiopia at one time had one of the most progressive refugee policies where particularly Eritreans were allowed to, some had families in Ethiopia, they were allowed to, to work, uh, to live outside the camps and uh, young people went to the university. But with too many people um, draining the country, the border closed. Uh, during this war, Eritrean military crossed into Tigray. And now we have an unfortunate situation where 20,000 Eritreans have actually, are actually missing. Um, there are rumors that they were forced back into Eritrea. They may have been murdered. They may be detained. We just don't know. But people in the camps, we know that Hitsas, these camps in the north were closed and destroyed. We saw the satellite images and those, many of the refugees have fled to the south of Tigray. At the same time, we have Tigrayans who are fleeing the war from Tigray into Sudan. Um, right now, uh, UNHCR, this is as of February of this year, there are uh, over 61,000 registered Tigrayans in different camps. Since they all were fleeing to the camps right on the border, uh, over 35,000 have been relocated. And you can see here um, the four camps and the numbers where they're relocated. And uh, again, just to conclude and hand it over to Mr. Mohammed. It's, it's, it's a war in plain sight of the international community um, with uh, 2.2 or 1.2 million 
people displaced internally, uh, the 61,000 refugees in Sudan, the 90, uh, uh, the over 70,000 Eritrean refugees living on bare necessities in the South. It's a region there where unfortunately the uh, Ethiopian government, although it's agreed to humanitarian access, um, only a few NGOs have been allowed inside. People are on the brink of starvation. For three months, they've been without food. They've been without uh, the water system. Uh, the power goes out. Um, Ethiopian and Eritrean troops are occupying the major towns um, and there's fighting throughout the country. Um, so with those cheerful words, I'll hand it over to Mr. Mohammed. Thank you, Annette, for uh, that presentation, for giving us uh, a lot of good information and background on the situation. Um, before we get to Mohammed, I want to introduce him. So we have with us Mohammed Idris, who is the co-founder and executive director of Araha, um, which for if you don't know is uh, the American Relief Agency for the Horn of Africa. His organization was founded in 2000, so they've been around for over 20 years. Um, uh, he's also a board member of the Interaction Coalition. As I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Interaction is an alliance of around 180 NGOs that work to serve the world's most vulnerable populations. He's also previously served from 2007 to 2014 on the board of directors at Life for Relief and Development, which is an NGO that delivers humanitarian aid around the world. Uh, Mohammed earned his bachelor's degree in business administration from St. Mary's University and a master's in management from Hamlin, but he couldn't stay away. So he's back doing a PhD in organization development and change at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. So Mohammed is going to talk to us about his uh, most recent visit to the refugee camps in Eastern Sudan. He was actually there. Um, and so I will turn it over to him to talk about what he saw and what his concerns are. So take it away, Mohammed. It looks like you're muted, Mohammed. There we go, perfect. Now. Yeah, th thank you, Chloe, for the introduction and uh, for inviting me to join you today in this briefing. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be uh, with you this morning. And thank you, Anna, for uh, the wonderful uh, illustration for, of the problem. I think uh, you, you put it very simple way, uh, uh, and it is, it is a problem that's very complicated and there are many parts going on there, but, but you, you put it very well. So thank you for that. Um, uh, just to give a brief information about uh, our brief introduction about Araha, we are um, an organization based in Minnesota. Uh, founded by East African American 20 years ago. This is our 20th anniversary. Um, we work in the Horn of Africa specifically. That's actually our focus. Uh, so we have uh, presence and field offices in Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Kenya. And we work um, both relief and development um, relief whenever there is a man-made disaster or natural disaster like uh, um, drought or, or uh, flood. Uh, actually, most, most of our relief work is between those two extremes, either combating um, a severe drought or a severe flood, which is uh, another sign of uh, the global warming we are uh, living in today. Uh, and whenever there is a stability, we like to go to development and empowering um, uh, the people we serve through education, vocational training, and other uh, program. Um, let me just give a little bit uh, overview about the situation in Sudan. Um, the situation in Sudan, and before I move to that, I just want to add a couple points to what Anna said about the situation in Ethiopia. Uh, keep in mind that Ethiopia is the largest country in the Horn of Africa, where over you know 100 million population almost. So the problem in Ethiopia it really will send shocking waves to 
uh, all neighboring countries. And, and that is something we have to keep in mind when we are talking about the situation. So that the destabilization of Ethiopia is actually is a problem for the whole uh, Horn of Africa. Uh, another point I want to add when she talk about the Eritrean refugees in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Tigray, in Ethiopia, uh, this is one of the things that we as humanitarian, this is the, the last thing we want to happen where refugees who um, seek uh, refuge to another country uh, from uh, a dictatorship or uh, a specific policy like the one in Eritrea where there is a indefinite military service, uh, where a lot of young people are fleeing in a daily basis. And then they found themselves that uh, they are in the, with the troops of that country that they fled from. So that is the, the worst nightmare to have as a refugee is to find yourself in that situation, uh, in, in an area where it's supposed to be, um, you are protected and, and, and by the UN, uh, by the UNHCR and by the hosting government. But that's, unfortunately, that's the situation. So going back to Sudan, you may know that um, uh, since the fall of the previous regime of Omar al-Bashir, um, uh, Sudan have been going through some difficult time really. Uh, the, the, you, can, you can call it a fragile right now, very fragile. And, and the reason for that is because there is no one government. There is um, a government that has many elements. There is a military element, there is a civilian um, element, and both of them have a different agenda and a competing agenda. And that's just make it um, uh, a good recipe for um, uh, destabilization, and, and that's what we're seeing right now in Darfur, in Eastern Sudan. You maybe heard about uh, the violence in Darfur where over 250 people died recently and thousands of people displaced. Um, but, we, but maybe you didn't hear about what happened in Eastern Sudan also where similar tribal issues um, have been uh, um, going on and, 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 and the whole Eastern Sudan with, was in, in turmoil for almost the last year. Um, uh, so the reason is because Sudan is going through a transition government and, uh, and that means um, there is no one government and there is a fragile situation um, and they did not come yet to uh, election and all these things that were we, people are hoping to stabilize situation. Um, now with this situation in, 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 with this in mind also, uh, what made it worse is that the pandemic uh, and the lockdown uh, that happened last year, um, it sent many or a, a large portion of, uh, of the population, not only in Sudan, but in many part of East Africa, uh, especially those who work uh, in a day-to-day -day services, you know, the ladies who sell tea in the, in the street or uh, the man who, you know, um, work in a, in a, you know, in a, in a, in a day-to-day -day work. Those people, um, because of the lockdown, they have been moved also to uh, among the, those who need the, uh, an assistance. Uh, so this situation really made the livelihood very, very difficult. Um, I, I, another factor was the inflation. Um, is just uh, just to give you an indication of that. Uh, when Omar al Bashir left the the the, the uh, you know uh, was uh, tumbled down, uh, he the 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 exchange rate was one dollar versus sixty to seventy pound. Now uh, it is one dollar, uh, and you exchange it to four hundred pound. So you can imagine just for a regular person um, uh, to be how difficult it is going to be for even just to, to get bread and, 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 and to be just basic necessities. And actually in Sudan right now, I was there a month ago and it's really uh, very difficult there. Um, uh, going back to uh, the Ethiopian refugees who left uh, um, Ethiopia, it's uh, there are about 60,000 almost. And they are, um, as Anna mentioned, they are in four location, uh, Hamdayit, which is a border town. It, it's, it has about 27,000. 
uh, and then there are two camp, uh, Umrah Kuba and uh, Abdul Netuba, uh, and both of them host about uh, 34,000 uh, refugees. Uh, in general, the situation um, is uh, the, the service are not adequate. Um, many refugees, they don't have enough shelter. Uh, many families uh, share one tent, uh, sometimes two families, sometimes more. Um, in, 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 in areas where like the border town, those refugees are not finding even basic necessities of life uh, because they, they want them to go to the permanent camps. Um, and, 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 but those refugees wanna stay so that maybe they may go back home if things become um, better. Uh, sanitation is a big issue right now. Um, um, and just, you know, having enough latrines, uh, cleanliness, sanitation, things like that. Uh, among the refugees also, there are cases of COVID-19 that, uh, that appeared, which is uh, uh, a little bit worrying. Um, uh, but these are just, uh, um, uh, there, there is also lack of uh, non-food items. A lot of those refugees left home without having anything. So they don't have even, even if you give them a food basket, they don't have the tool to cook, uh, which is another, uh, another problem. But the situation really, um, my, maybe the, some of the observation I have when I visited the camp, um, is that uh, um, a lot of those refugees have trauma, have a bad experience uh, uh, to what happened in, in Tigray. Um, one, two, two of the refugees who work with our team, uh, by the way, Araha was providing uh, food uh, in uh, Hamdayit and also in Umrah Kuba. We have a feeding center. So two of the refugees were among, the, uh, among uh, uh, our team in, 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 in uh, that serving the people there. So when I visited, I, I was chatting with them and, and suddenly I asked one of them and she's a, she's a young woman with two children. And I told her, how was your trip? How, how did you come here? And suddenly she cried. And because I just remind her with the most awful and horrible experience she went through. And she couldn't even uh, you know, talk to me. She just um, um, you know, uh, looked back and, and she started just crying. And, and then the, the, her, her uh, team, they told me that her husband was shot in front of her uh, with two bullets, one in the chest, one in the head. And, and she saw her, her husband, um, you know, breathing the last breath and telling her just to take the kids and go and, and escape. And, and this is just one example of many refugees who have this uh, trauma. So there is a lot of atrocities happen uh, during uh, the Tigray war and from different um, people, from different parts, from different actors, as uh, Aneta mentioned, uh, the, the area was, uh, there were many actors in that area. Um, but maybe I think by the time we will know uh, many things uh, as we come. Uh, and, the, and the last thing is, is uh, my, my, um, the hatred between the communities that that this war brought, like between the Amhara and the Tigrayan, you know, they just now uh, hate each other just because of you know the, this of what happened. So just normal uh, people uh, hate each other based on who they are, and that's unfortunate. Unfortunately, um, um, uh, so this is just one some of the observation, and I can't talk a lot, but I have ten minutes. Uh, my hope, my hope, and I want to end with this is that um, things become settled down in Ethiopia and, and, and those people can go back home uh, before this take longer time. Because um, if, if we forget about, if, if this is take longer, they will be just one of those refugees who have been forgotten. We have in Eastern Sudan, we have refugees from the 1967. Um, and those people will be another forgotten refugees if they don't come back. So that's what we hope for. Um, and um, that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, and um, I, I hope I covered at least some aspect and maybe we can cover more later on with the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. That was wonderful. I mean, it's so important to get an understanding not only of what's going on um, in the Eastern part of the country, but how that is relating to the instability that's that's uh, kind of having shockwaves, as you said, not only in Sudan, but throughout the, the, the whole area. So, um, and it's 
obviously such a unique insight to be able to uh, learn about what to, what you're actually seeing in the camps because with COVID and all of the travel restrictions, we're not getting a lot of those um, stories firsthand. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I want to move on to our last speaker, Angelina Nyajima Simon. Um, Angelina is going to talk to us about the situation that's going on in South Sudan. Um, you'll probably see that there are a lot of parallels between uh, the situation in South Sudan with uh, the UN's withdrawal um, to similar situation in parts of Sudan. So with that, uh, Angelina is the founder and executive director of Hope Restoration South Sudan. That is an organization based in South Sudan that's dedicated to providing holistic services and advocating for survivors of gender-based violence. Uh, she's also the chair of the South Sudan National NGO Steering Committee, where she advocates for women-led organizations. Uh, she's been very busy in the last couple of years. She spoke at the UN Security Council in New York in March of 2019 to advocate for the rights of women and girls and their protection in terms of uh, the UN mission in South Sudan. She has spoken at many international conferences on the importance of supporting uh, GBV prevention and response work. And she earned her bachelor's degree in international relations from Cavendish University in Uganda. So with that, I will turn it over to Angelina who is going to talk about uh, the situation of internally displaced persons in South Sudan. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate my colleagues for very comprehensive uh, highlight of what is really going on within the region. And uh, at one point I feel touched because I remember uh, Ethiopia has been a country that hosted me and my family in 1987 when my country enter, started uh, entering into the civil war. So having background of being a refugee and seeing uh, refugees is never ending anytime soon. It's quite heartbreaking. So to narrow it down back to my country, well, I think, uh, Basically, as South Sudanese, we can say it a little bit. We haven't enjoyed the relative peace that other citizens in other countries have really enjoyed because we've been in a conflict for over five decades. And uh, when we get our independence in 2011, uh, every South Sudanese was quite awful that this could be uh, the end of our movement from country to country and it's time to come back home. But when it reached to 2013, uh, our dreams got shattered and the country get back to quite civil war that was quite uh, difficult for people like us to really handle. And uh, again, it started in 2016. So uh, South Sudanese population has been on and off in terms of crisis. And uh, when you try to look at the scenario, South Sudanese, we have over 2.5, 2.2 million refugees uh, across the neighboring countries with uh, a population of 1.6 uh, 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 internal displaced persons uh, across uh, the refugees, uh, the, the, the IDPs come within the country. Now, when we try to look at uh, the status of uh, our peace agreement within the country from across all the parties, it has, quite, it has not been quite awful as we expected because the slow movement of the peace agreement in the country has been quite worrying and it hasn't built confidence for the uh, displaced people or the refugees in the neighboring countries to come back home. Now, when we try to look at the issues of the POC side and uh, the, uh, the resignation of the uh, POC into uh, IDP, a lot of services that were being provided when it's a POC compared to the services that are being provided as it's uh, an IDP site, like uh, resignated to just an IDP settlement, those services are lacking. When you try to look at even the POC Juba, they have been going for scuppers of some time. There's no water. At times, there's no health facility. At times, there's a lot of challenges that are really happening within. Even the wash facility are quite getting more bad because most of it's not more a priority in terms of humanitarian response. So we try to have this back and forth discussion, but technically a lot of uh, IDP site has already been closed, the one in board, the one in WOW. So also UNMIS is still ongoing with the issues of the one for Bentu, 
uh, maybe Malakal and uh, and uh, yeah and Malakal and those are uh, plus the Juba. Those are the big uh, IDP site. Oh, those are the big POC site. And when you try to have some discussion with the IDPs within the camp, they're still quite worried in terms of their security because their security is being handed over to the government and it has been raising a lot of eyebrows that they feel it's really not safe for them to return anywhere. And when you try to look at it, uh, with, apart from the internally conflicts or communal conflicts that are happening, uh, last year, we coupled with uh, severe flood that affected over uh, seven, seven states out of 10 in the country. And a lot of people tend to really lose a lot of their livelihood. The, 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 those who did farming, all their, their products were submerged into water. So they are not able to really stand on their own. And when you try to look at even those that managed to really survive, then due to the fear, they cannot go to their farming land. So all this back and forth, it becomes extremely difficult. And when you try to look at the humanitarian uh, crisis in South Sudan, mostly for this year, is going to be quite very intensive and very high, mostly in terms of food insecurity. So this has been quite challenging to us as a local organization and also to, to the entire country because we want to look at it. This piece has to work. Uh, the, the, the peace partners all along really need to just make the commitment and really allow South Sudanese to enjoy the, rel the relative peace that they wanted. Because a lot of those who are in, even in Kakuma refugee camp, like also in, 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 in Uganda refugee camp, in Sudan, it's not their wish, but because they feel the situation is quite difficult. They, they don't, they are not sure of their security uh, situation across the places. We do a, a, a tracking of the refugees returnees who are coming back home up to their final destination. But when they go back to their home of origin, they don't even have shelters. Again, they are not even sure of the security because there are no police station. There's no basic services in those locations. So before you know it, they tend to either go back to different places or move back to town where their families is because their children cannot go to school. When someone is sick, they cannot get health facilities, they cannot get medication. And also the road network is quite very poor. When you try to look at the protection part of it, also we've been having issues to do with SGDV cases. Well, the other positive part we have now, we have the GDV code that as of today, it has tried over 10 uh, uh, perpetrators who have committed uh, rape against women during those crises. And there's, a, and there's already a list of over almost 6,000 pending trials. But then they are also being overwhelmed because at times the civil servant or the lawyers are not getting their salaries. And at times it becomes so difficult for them to continue doing voluntary services and they are not getting anything. So it has been extremely difficult. When you try to look at the political part of it, about the 35% of the women uh, to be considered across the, the sectors, when you try to look at it, barely, uh, we have one governor who is a female and three deputy governors which are females, at least that is a little bit positive. But when we try to look at the local governments which has not yet been formed, some states have formed the, 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 the state, uh, the, the, the director generals. Almost in most states, we don't have uh, director generals that has been appointed as females. You get only one state has appointed one person out of 10. So all these things, it, whatever has been signed within the peace agreement is not quite being followed or being respected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelina. That was wonderful. Um, as, as I'm sure everyone can see, there are so many parallels between um, the crises that uh, South Sudan and the rest of the region are facing. Um, obviously, notably, climate change being one uh, really large um, factor. So uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for wonderful presentations. Um, I've got a, a couple more things to plug and then we can get into questions. Um, if you're interested in joining our USCRI policy and advocacy listserv for weekly updates, uh, we usually have a weekly letter that goes around with updates and events um, or any other updates and publications that USCRI is putting out. 
we will drop the link to our um, email. You can shoot us an email and just let us know you'd like to be signed up. We are also active on social media as well. So we'll drop those links to our Twitter and Instagram and Facebook um, if you're interested in following along with USDRI's work. Um, I have, we do have a paper coming out very soon with working with Angelina. Angelina has very kindly done um, an interview with me. So we will be publishing that in the next couple of weeks, talking a lot more in depth about the situation in South Sudan with the withdrawal of uh, the UN peacekeeping troops from the protection of civilian sites um, and that the effects on gender-based violence. Uh, and Angelina has a bunch of great recommendations, not only for the UN, but also for the international community about how we can support uh, protection issues during that time. So I wanna just give a huge thank you to all of our panelists um, and Please now feel free to drop your questions in the chat box uh, so that we can ask away. But um, before we get to those questions, I wanted to circle back a little bit to the uh, effects of climate change that Mohammed and Angelina, you both talked about, um, touched on that issue. I wanted to know what you both think um, about the effects of climate change on these crises? How, how much are they impacting uh, these crises? And is anything being done to address it? And if not, what do you think could be done to address it? So I'll let either one of you take it away. If, uh, okay, if Angelina was not, I'd like to go first, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, but just to, um, <clears throat> so we, we think um, the global uh, issue and the climate change uh, in the Horn of Africa specifically, I think is, 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 is expected and predicted by scientists to be one of the worst. As you may all know, Africa is considered um, is the most affected continent. Uh, although it is the least contributor to the, the pollution that caused um, the climate change. Um, and in, in Africa, East Africa specifically is expected to be hotter, is going to expect it to be more drought, more famine uh, because of uh, you know, the, the equator um, passed through the Horn of Africa. So uh, there is, uh, there is uh, the hot is, is just get, is getting hotter and it's getting, um, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, it's getting also dr more drought, more severe drought. But it become a, a, a phenomena, uh, not only just one time or two times, but um, we have been seeing every two years almost either we have a severe drought or we have a, a severe flood. Um, uh, so that, that, that for us is, uh, as an organization, uh, this is actually, we, we consider it the, 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 the strongest uh, and maybe the, the most dangerous threat, um, natural uh, threat to the region. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, local governments are not capable of making some infrastructure that could make this uh, uh, less. Uh, one of the major issue uh, in, in the Horn of Africa, sometimes it's not that there is no rain. Sometimes there is rain and there is water, but they come and just go to the ocean. Uh, there is no any infrastructure that capture um, uh, these uh, water so that many uh, population can benefit from, uh, from them. Uh, so uh, as an organization, we start working even, uh, uh, start doing project like Sandam. Uh, we did our first project in Ethiopia, uh, Sandam, uh, which is basically it helped in making, in slowing the flow of water uh, through rivers. Uh, so this way uh, you can capture millions of gallons of water uh, be before the, the, the dam and you can benefit uh, you know, from that uh, by installing um, hand pump water wells and, you know, and, and the whole area could, could benefit from that. So this is just uh, part. So in summary, this is actually one of the um, um, 
you, the, the, one of the uh, threats uh, to the Horn of Africa. And, and I think as, as, a, as, a, as an organization, we need to uh, pay more attention to that. And that's what causing also a lot, a lot of migration of population from Africa to Europe and, and, and others. Just people are, uh, the, the resources are becoming scarce and, and people are fighting on small things. Thank you, Mohammed. Angelina, if you have um, an answer as well, you're ha welcome to chime in. We do also have another question in that just came for, for you. Well, um, actually, it just more of what uh, my colleague Mohammed have already mentioned, like as I say during my discussion a little bit early that uh, last year we got flood which affected seven states out of 10. So that is quite massive and it started from 2019. When you try to look at our case in the country here, we had a series of meetings with the Ministry of, uh, disaster, of Humanitarian and Disaster Management, but uh, almost everybody knows about our situation within the country that whatever you try to explain in, to the government counterpart, it's always there's no uh, resources to respond. And uh, a lot of communities have gone to uh, doing uh, uh, this one, a local dike, which keep on breaking when a lot of water uh, come over. So this is quite uh, difficult, although, we are still expecting more flood this year. As you mentioned, it's also very hot. Even at times you found yourself, the temperature goes up to almost 40 plus, which is not normal. So meaning technically the, the climate change is really affecting seriously in Africa. And as much as we can say, okay, we are not really contributed into the climate change, but then we are also being affected like any other country globally. So what do we do? And it come back to the question, okay, we'll be relying on the donor community to be supporting us. But then there's something that at times the, the humanitarian community look at it, the, your own host government need to take lead so that at least they follow, which is really not happening, that taking of lead. So we end up doing the small, small contribution that the humanitarian does, but then we are still being displaced, we are still being affected. Uh, trees are always being cut throughout, nobody's really, uh, uh, discussing the issues of you should stop cutting the trees or you plant more trees. All these things are not happening. Thank you. Thank you both so much for that. Um, you both really highlighted how much climate change is just inextricable from what has been going on um, throughout the region. Um, we do have two more questions that just came in. So I know we're getting close to time. Please feel free to stick around for the last couple of questions, but um, understand as well if everyone needs to get to their lunch. So um, this one is for Angelina. Um, someone asked, what is the difference between the POCs or protection of civilian sites um, and IDP or uh, internally displaced person sites um, in terms of both protection and services? So Angelina, if you can explain that, that would be great. Um. The protection of uh, civilians side during the 2013 crisis and 2016 crisis, it's an area, it's a place that was quite open by all means to rescue the civilians that were being killed outside. And all the humanitarians were responding, all the services were available. But then since there's no intensive conflicts that the armies are seeing within the country, they feel it's quite safe. And if the civilians who are within the POC are not willing to maybe go back to their communities, the services that were being offered as, a, 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 as an emergency are being narrowed down, thinking that they need to maybe build it outside the POC side, outside the, the, the POC side, like uh, within the communities then that might attract the communities to go. And I think I highlighted a little bit, services has been narrowed down because it's no more like a, a priority to the humanitarians within the country as it's done. And they feel the time that they've been hosted is enough and they need to get out. But one way of getting them out is to resignate the POC into the IDP settlement, just like you are living within the host environment. It's no more like, they don't feel like it's an, an emergency like before. So what is the difference right now is the amount of services that were being offered in 2013 and 2016 and right now they have been reduced. Like almost they have cut most of the services. 
And I mentioned to you about the water, about the health facilities, about the wash facilities, those things have gone down. In terms of the education, when they were opening many centers, now they have narrowed down to few centers that are running. Thank you. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, and as we know, on the UN is trying to um, convert those to IDP sites, which would mean largely as well that um, that the government of South Sudan is going to be taking over. So that's that's another um, big difference. We have a question here for Mohammed. Uh, what is your organization doing to let local people know about the issue of climate change? Uh, this person says most of our people in Africa are not informed, informed about it and therefore their governments don't help. What is your view? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the climate change, unfortunately, people are are not aware of in Africa. There is no a lot of um, awareness program about it, and the government even um, not also doing uh, in in that aspect that raising awareness about that because just people running after their basic um, necessities in life. And although this is a threat to their livelihood, but unfortunately. It's considered talking about it. It's considered like uh, talking about luxury things. Um, but for us as an Africa, uh, for us in Araha, we consider it actually uh, we include it as part of our strategic plan, uh, and we consider the severe drought and the famine that is happening. Uh, this phenomena uh, is, is is a recurring phenomena, and we 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 consider it is 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 part of the climate change that's happening. So we try to look at the we try to look at it from a comprehensive um, uh, or or we, we try to produce a holistic approach, where um, we try to address the issue of uh, water shortage uh, through a program like uh, water wells, uh, sand dam, uh, and and water harvesting. Uh, just even in a small scale, like going in a in a, we to to schools and. And putting these gutters, uh, and so that when with the the rain come, uh, the the at least the the school have water for one month or two month when it is raining, um, and 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 just to capture as much as possible uh, a, a, a building dam uh, so that it can uh, capture water. That's a whole part of our program, but also focusing on uh, nutrition of children and 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 and, and mothers. Uh, this is also one of the things we, we start doing, uh, introducing a school lunch program uh, for schools, especially primary um, uh, schools, and having at least one meal per day. Uh, we partner with Feed My Starving Children and Rise Against Hunger uh, to provide uh, meals um, daily uh, in many schools. Remember, in, in 2011, when the famine hit Somalia, and 260,000 people died. Half of them were children under the age of five. So every time we lose uh, thousands of, of our uh, future generation uh, in this famine and this uh, severe drought. Uh, so, and, and we try also to address the issue of uh, deforestation uh, uh, through encouraging um, you know, forestation, through uh, uh, in, uh, installing or, or uh, putting as part of many of our project uh, is to uh, to give people plants so that they can they can uh, put it in their in their home and they can grow their trees. Uh, um, so we have a, a different strategy to address this issue, but we as an organization we consider it this is one of the main challenges that we are facing in the region. Thank you for that answer, Mohammed. I know we are a little bit over time. We did answer one of the other questions that came in in the chat box, so don't, don't uh, forget to check that out. If anyone has any further questions, please feel free to email us at the policy uh, email that we threw in the chat box. Thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you again to Mohammed, Angelina, and Annette for such great information. Um, we will tune in next time for our third quarterly policy briefing. If you want to know more about that, again, sign up for the email and we will make sure that you get an invite to that. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.